Um, so we will move into our next section then, um, economic transformation raising our site. We've got three provocations starting with, and all of our speakers don't really need an introduction, got such a fantastic lineup, but Kate Rayworth will start us off, the writer of Donut Economics, Senior Associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute, and also a Professor of Practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Um, so we'll start with Kate Rayworth, and then we'll go on to two other speakers afterwards. Kate, over to you. Thanks so much, Jimmy. And it's a real pleasure to be here today and joining you. So I'm going to be talking about creating a well-being economy in Scotland, one that enables Scotland to thrive. And I'm going to share some of the ideas of donut economics that I hope they can be valuable in the broader thinking and the holistic vision that you're creating. So we know that this century has begun with multiple crises that hit people with huge, vast inequalities, gender and race, wealth and power, global north and global south. And we need to transform the dynamics and the direction of our economies to transform this. One way you can think about this is through a donut. So think of this as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. The goal is to leave no one in the hole in the middle, falling short on the essentials of life, but collectively not to overshoot the ecological ceiling where we put so much pressure on Earth's life support systems that we kick our living planet out of balance. The inside comes from the sustainable development goals, the outside are the planetary boundaries of Earth system science. So the donut calls on us to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And we know that meeting everyone's needs is utterly interdependent with protecting the life support systems of planet Earth. If the goal of this is not endless growth, but thriving in dynamic balance, we're very far from that right now. As a world, this shows us that billions of people worldwide aren't meeting their most essential needs, and we are already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So we need to come into this from both sides at the same time. And in every nation, this calls for new ways of thinking, a new vision for the economy, new policies, new business models, because last century's ones were not designed to solve this and they're not gonna get us there. It's either an overwhelming moment for some people or in a moment of incredible opportunity for reinvention and bringing about the changes we already know we need. How can we get there? I believe we need to transform the dynamics of our economies, two fundamental dynamics. We've inherited economies that are degenerative by design, linear industrial processes that are running down Earth's life support systems. And we need to turn these into regenerative ones, cyclical or circular, so that resources aren't used up. They're used again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly. And this, of course, is the foundations of a circular economy. Some examples of how this is being put into practice Regenerative by design is a city centre that's free of cars and using public transport, foot and bicycles. So the energy that is powering a renewable economy, a circular economy is renewable energy. In Amsterdam, they've adopted circular policy, including in construction. How can the construction materials be used again and again in circular building? We also need to regenerate the living systems of which we're a part. The sponge city concept here in Kunlian, China, recognizing that whether through the floodplain or through climate adaptation, water comes and goes in cities. So how do we absorb it? And how do we turn rivers, as in Medellin, not into an industrial sewer, but into a source of life? So at the same time as becoming regenerative by design, we recognize that we've inherited economies that are divisive in many ways, whether through the infrastructure, legislation, inheritance, they tend to drive opportunity and value into the hands of a few. And we need to transform that into economies that actually share opportunity and value far more equitably with all who co-create it. That turns out to be the whole of society. So creating distributive economies by design, just another set of illustrations of that. Preston is one of the places we know that is modeling community wealth building, using the power of procurement to buy from locally co-ops from employee-owned enterprises, from local enterprises, reinvesting public money in the local economy. Vienna, a city with affordable housing, over 60% of residents live in city-run housing. It's affordable, normal, central. It's what everyone does, and it transforms housing affordability. Stockton in California, trialing a guaranteed basic income. Again, trialing what does it look like and how can it work to ensure that everybody has the money they need to buy the essentials of life. And then very locally using space in Bogota, why give 
public space and cities over to cars when you can turn it into parks? How do we reposition public land so that it creates public luxury for all? So we need to transform the dynamics of our economies to become regenerative and distributive by design from the local to the city, to the region, to the nation. What would this look like in Scotland? Let me invite us to dive in and think, can Scotland live within the donut? What would this mean? Well, we've created a tool that would invite you to use. You could dive inside it, unroll that donut, and then go inside between the social foundation of meeting the needs of all within the means of the living planet, both here in Scotland and in Scotland's relationship to the whole world. And this can become a canvas for exploration. Let me take you inside. So Scotland and the donut, here's the question. Can Scotland become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? And this breaks out into what we call the four lenses on life. Can, how can all the people in Scotland thrive, everybody, from all different walks of life. What does it mean to thrive there? How can Scotland be as generous as the wildland next door, the lands of Scotland? How can human settlements in Scotland reflect nature's generosity? These are the local aspirations of a place, but every place is connected globally and so needs to take a global responsibility. How can Scotland respect the health of the whole planet and the well-being of all people? Let me take you into each of these lenses and I invite you to think of it through this place where you are, whether it's at the level of your district, your city or your nation. How could all of the people of Scotland thrive? These photos, of course, are not from Scotland. I invite you to imagine pictures from your own place here. What does thriving mean to people here? It's going to differ in Scotland as elsewhere in the world. I first met Catherine Trebek when she did a brilliant humankind index of Scotland, asking people across Scotland, the nation, what does thriving mean here? Creating a really rich profile of that. What has COVID-19 made visible that was always there, but hidden and must now be acted upon? And which aspect of Scottish culture will turn out to be your greatest strength? Every place must pivot and must draw on the strength of its culture, its values and its pride to make that pivot. What will be yours? How can Scotland be as generous as the wildland next door? So the wildland, nature's gifts of Scotland, nature is generous. Nature cleanses the air and houses biodiversity. She stores carbon, cycles water and harvests energy. She regulates the temperature, builds and protects soil and makes us feel at home. How can human settlements in Scotland from cities to agriculture be places that mimic nature's generosity? How can Scotland store more carbon and house more wildlife? Harvest more solar energy, wind power, manage water and build more soil. This is the local ecological aspiration of a place. What would it mean to map Scotland's aspirations and initiatives and potential here? How can Scotland respect the health of the whole planet? Think of all the global supply chains that Scotland draws upon from clothing and food and electronics and consumer goods and construction materials and then the waste stream that, that flows out. How can your cities and nation respect your impact on the whole planet in terms of carbon emissions and material footprint? What can you do within your nation to transform that? Transforming local mobility and national mobility, creating a circular economy to reduce that material footprint worldwide, transforming systems, whether it's food or industry that become an entry point into wider transformation to bring the nation back within planetary boundaries. And then thinking still of those global supply chains, What's the impact on workers throughout the world in those supply chains? What are retailers and brands on sale in Scotland's cities and towns? What are the government's procurement practices and responsibilities on social practice? And what's the labor behind the label? It's never as pretty as the brand on the box. So how can Scotland respect the well-being of people beyond its own borders, whether it's locally or internationally? If I put these four lenses together, they create a beautiful canvas in which you can place any issue, whether it's your whole economic strategy or health or education or housing or transport, place them at the center or the future of jobs and invite you to play with this and explore these from a holistic perspective. If I was to put, say, housing here, you could ask for yourselves, how can Scotland provide housing that's affordable, that builds community, that creates good local jobs in building and insulating and retrofitting that housing? How can the housing invite nature back into cities and settlements so that people feel they are nestled in the ecosystem of place?
How can the housing be built in ways that are circular and that reduce the footprint of carbon on the planet and while respecting the workers in those global supply chains? There are, of course, many issues here, but the key is to look at how they're interconnected and how specific initiatives in the nation can tackle multiple targets at the same time and bring about that dynamic change of regenerative and distributive design. We've trialed these and run workshops like this in Philadelphia, Portland and Amsterdam back in 2019, but now with more cities and regions worldwide. Some examples from Amsterdam use the donut to reimagine and create a circular strategy for their city, putting it at the top of their ambition for transformation there. In Birmingham, fabulous work going on in a neighborhood called Ladywood, run by Civic Square, taking these ideas right from the street level, in, in, embedding it with communities. How can we invent, reinvent our own community here? And in the Brussels capital region, using the framework to think about and analyze the status of the region from all these four lenses as a means into economic transition. What we've learned from working with all of these places and the policymakers come back to us and say, if we're going to transform the outcomes, we need to transform our own design, our organisations, our institutions, our ways of working. And so we started working with them on what we call the powers to act around the deep design of places. Many places, including Scotland, want to move from asking only how do we make our economy grow? That's a very 20th century question. To how can our economy help us to thrive, to create a well being economy here? How can it be in service of these bigger goals that we have? We believe there are five design traits we can use to dive deep into the underlying drivers of what pulls us back or, or pivots us forward the purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance of a place. So purpose, how can purpose be stated, imagined, and the leadership of that narrative and vision, whether it's from Amsterdam or Melbourne, or indeed from Scotland, from Wales, from New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, nations that are putting well-being at the front of their vision and purpose? How can networks be built and strengthened, whether it's through civic networks of deliberative democracy, citizens' assembly, working closely with trade unions to ensure that everyone's voice is brought into decision-making, networks of in industry to create that ecosystem that allows circularity to happen and networks between nations like the WeGo, the well-being economy governments that are connecting and learning together what does it mean to bring well-being into practice governance how can we put in place the ambitious regulations like circularity in Amsterdam use experimental policy making as in Finland bring in long-term thinking like in Wales Bring in the metrics that will make us ask, are we achieving our higher order goals? And let's hold ourselves to account on that. Then going deeper, ownership. Who owns the sources of wealth creation? Who owns the land and housing in the nation? That has huge implications for how that wealth is used and how it's redistributed or invested in place. Who owns the utilities? Paris privatized its water and then brought it back under public control when it realized what a loss it was to give up that control. Who owns the data? Who owns the enterprises? And as the minister said, how can they be more investing and supporting cooperatives, employee owned, locally owned and investing in those so that value created in Scotland is reinvested in Scotland and enriches everyone? And finance, whether it's from the budgetary cycle to procurement powers, to investing and divesting public money, or indeed making affordable finance available to SMEs and small enterprises. Finance, of course, plays a crucial role in ensuring that it's in service to the goal above. So let me pull back and invite again Scotland to say what draws us back in these five design traits across governments, but also across institutions and civic society. What draws us back to the old ways of working? What already pivots us forward? What can we already work with? Recognizing that, of course, there may be localities, cities, regions. Then there's what's happening at the level of Scotland as a nation within the UK, within the world, because you can map onto that so many things that pull you back and pivot you forward and then ask, but what can we already stop doing because it's within our locality or within the nation of Scotland? What can we already start doing because it's here locally or within Scotland? And what can we only do when we work together with others? Let me pull back and say that we're about to launch these tools um, and make them public through Donut Economics Action Lab. So they will be in the public domain. And if you want to use them as part of your own processes, we'd be delighted if they're in service of the bigger project that you're bringing about. So I've asked, how can Scotland thrive by becoming regenerative, 
and distributive by design? What does this look like in so many different sectors of the economic strategy? How do they become real? How can Scotland use this holistic thinking to bring about local aspirations within the context of its global responsibilities? And how can you draw on all those deep designs of a place and put into action the powers that lie within action now in Scotland? Thanks so much. I really look forward to the conversation. Kate Rayworth, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, every time I listen to you, which is a lot, um, I hear and I learn something new. Um, I love your articulation of the interconnectedness of the issues that we face. That beautiful articulation of purpose, networks, governance, ownership and finance, and working collectively to deliver our higher order goals. Um, I note what you say about the Donut Economics Action Lab tools as well. And I think everyone here would find some use of either sharing those or using those for themselves so thank you so much for all of that that was fantastic um i did encourage people to use the chat function um on this call if you would like to in response to some of these presentations you're very welcome to we won't have time for questions at this stage but we do have breakout sessions and time for questions later on um so again ahead of time fantastic moving on um our next speaker is stephen lowe from um, Unison Scotland, and he is our policy officer. Stephen, over to you. Sorry, I, I work these days consists of going between four different uh, video conferencing modes, and I can never find out which one the unmute. I always forget where the unmute button is. Um, Quite obviously, the, the necessity for a, a, that donut-based economic type approach, I, I mean, it, it's, it's verging on the unarguable, you know, because there are physical limits, and equally, there is complete misery, and we need to find, you know, we need to work to alleviate the one, whereas we can't breach the other. So, it, it, while we, we have definite limits beyond which we, we just can't go. And, and this is a powerful model for looking at the exact nature of the programme and devising solutions. This is fine. Where the challenge is, is in, frankly, getting the political will developed to do these things at scale. Um, and more to the point, I think, in a, in a Scottish context, it's to go beyond doing these things rhetorically and actually delivering on them. Um, Scotland has had no shortage of fine plans about economic action, about environmental action, about job creation. Uh, and, about, and, and to be frank, not very much has been concretely delivered. I mean, there certainly did some things, but not hellish much. And that is the thing that I think needs to change. It's not getting a donor economic type model discussed, mentioned, paid lip service to. It is actually driving those changes and getting reality put on fine sounding words. And I don't wish to personalise it, but obviously all the Lorna Slater just, just gave us. <laughs> You know, she's now joined a government that's been in power for 14 years and has not delivered very much by way of green jobs at all, and certainly not in the renewable industry. You know, and, and this really fundamentally needs to change. Um, I mean, trade unions as a whole, uh, to a fairly high extent, are signed up to a just transition approach. And you know that's that's kind of across the board. So trade unions are not very tiny in perhaps specific instances, a barrier to doing any of this. Um, if you think about it, no institutions have dealt with trade unionism. Uh, sorry, beg your pardon, have dealt with change and the necessity for change more than trade unions. Um, you know, given that the labour movement essentially arose after. Uh, 
handling weavers suddenly discovered themselves out of work. You know, so we've been we've been dealing with industrialization and deindustrialization and change for a couple of hundred years. You know, there is a vast institutional reservoir of thinking through how things are done in the trade union movement. So, you know, we are very much partners in that. And it's also the case that our members tend to live in the houses that need retrofitted rather than, you know, circling, circling the Caribbean in their yachts. So, you know, the, the, there's, there's a vested interest there. So trade unions have to be part of that network as well. Um, governance, sorry, I'm just going to go through the sort of five things here. Governance is, is clearly a big issue. And it's one where, again, we have very fine words in Scotland, but we do also have some serious issues. If you look at the city region deals, for example, there is trade union input at a national level. There is no trade union input at the actual level of the city region deals themselves. And if you look at them, quite frankly, and the, I've not looked at what Glasgow came out with today, but I looked, I looked across them a few months back and they are still largely based on, and I'm simplifying a bit, but only a bit, they're still largely based on big infrastructure projects, taking people into a centre of population to work in high tech offices. Um, I don't see many people sitting, I don't see many people having used uh, travel infrastructure to get to a high tech office today. These things are entirely out of date now, and yet there seems very, very little thinking around what is also talked about, the, the place-based strategy and the idea that you can, you know, live your life really quite locally. Um, ownership, well, no surprise you that I think what we need is a great deal more public ownership. And yes, that can be at the community level and it can be cooperatives and all the rest of it, but fundamentally what we're going to need is a great deal more public services, publicly owned and publicly delivered. Now there's, there's a variety of ownership models there. We are actually in Scotland just about to go down a route that puts more public service, the, the so-called national care service won't actually deliver care and will actually expose a great deal of services to tendering exercises, which mm, I, I think are, are fundamentally going to favour Sodexo rather than the Ockenshugel Carers Cooperative. And, and, you know, there's a real, real danger there. And that in itself takes away from a donor economic foundational economy approach of keeping things within uh, local areas and, and you know, self-sustaining economies and so on. Um, and finally, finance. Um, the Scottish government are still basing economic transformation. You know, we await this 10-year uh, plan. However, in the programme for government, they're still talking about foreign direct investment as a mechanism of bringing things in. They were arguing for the, I, I realise they've fallen out with Westminster about this, but they were arguing for green ports, which were again based on bringing in foreign, <laughs> and frankly, uh, tax dodging firms in a bid. In a bit of, now, you know, you're not going to transform, and the Scottish National Investment Bank, that's not, it will doubtless support decent individual projects. But it is not aimed at being a shaper and transformer of the Scottish economy. I mean, it's still basically going to be funding individual projects that the market won't support for because they'll, they'll need longer term finance. But it's not aimed at shaping or, or, or reshaping the Scottish economy. And government needs to be a good deal more ambitious. Uh, if we're going to get the, the, the uh, sort of things that Professor Rayworth was, was advocating. But at the moment, we have fine words, we have very few signs of delivery, and that needs to change. Stephen, thank you so much. 
um, fantastic uh, presentation, which generated a lot of discussion in the chat function. Um, you spoke about the donut being unarguable. You spoke about moving beyond lip service into action with a range of examples of what's context specific in Scotland and some of the challenges of making sure that this is coordinated and not just kind of one off pieces of good activity that there is wind in the sails across the whole of the economy. Um, thank you so much. Really fascinating insight. And um, now we'll move on to Matthew Crichton. Um, who you all know, he's the guy who's been emailing you lots and lots, and he is the Sustainable Economy Advisor. Matthew, thank you again for all of your work on this event, bringing together a fantastic lineup of people and a large number of uh, contributors today and, and participants. Over to you. You're on mute. <laughs> all right, uh, that's a good start. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, I'm, uh, work at Friends of the Earth Scotland. I'm also the convener of the Scottish Environment Links Economics Group. So we've been thinking about these issues for quite some time. Um, and it's been really helpful to have um, Kate's presentation there, um, giving us, I think, some really helpful tools. Um, and also to have Stephen's um, thoughts, which make sure that we are, get our, our feet on the ground on this. It's about what's really happening uh, in Scotland, and that's what the, the challenge we have to think of. So <clears throat> I thought the tools which Kate was offering us should be used in this process. I like the idea of unrolling the donut and going down to different levels. Um, just before we, I move on to that, um, I, I just want to reflect on something I heard Kate say before. Um, you said something which um, stayed with me, which is that the tools of, and the theories of 21st century economics are turning out not to be uh, fit for the challenges of the 21st century. And I think that very much is the um, challenge which we are facing when we look at uh, how we make donut economics um, a reality. And I just want to comment that it's also possibly the case that the tools of uh, 20th century economics weren't fit for the challenges of the 20th century. Um, I just quickly, almost as an aside, refer to the National Performance Framework, which Phoebe will tell us more about um, later on. Um, and this is a great initiative which sets up a set of indicators by which we can judge uh, the, the progress of, um, of Scotland. And for the data which is currently available, it's not very up to date, but up and say to, up to say 2019, 2020, the performance has been pretty flat. Some things have got worse, some things have got better. A lot of the indicators have stayed the same, but at the same time, GDP has continued to grow. And the promise of the GDP enthusiasts is that there will be a trickle down and the, the, the consequence of better GDP or continuing GDP growth is that we will be able to improve on these other measures. And frankly, I think if you, you can look at it, that's what it's there for, it's for, for us to be able to scrutinize performance. Uh, it, this, this is not proven by the, by the data. And so we go back to that thing. No, the current tools are not sufficient, not only for our current challenges, but even for the ones which they were, they were designed for. So I, I want to, to um, I'm going to put my um, presentation on. What I'm going to talk through is the submission we made uh, to the uh, consultation process uh, on the National Strategy and Economic uh, Transformation. We being the group that organised this, uh, this event, that's uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland, which I work for, Scottish Environment Link and the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And um, I think it might be a decent, you know, some start at least to answering some of um, of uh, uh, Kate's, not, not answering the questions, but looking at how we might answer them. And that it certainly does help uh, to look at those things that she, you referred to, Kate, the purpose, networks, governance, ownership and finance. So let's go through this and see how, how well this goes. If I can manage to share my screen, it should be easy enough. Um, there we go. Share. And now we go to a slideshow. Except I'm now. Um, oh. 
my the the thing where I can do the slideshow is obscured by the symbol the, the stuff from from uh, from uh, from Zoom. Anyone going? I'm gonna. I'll, I'll, I'll just skip the slideshow bit. I'll just go through the slides. So we called it um, consultation time scale, which is an issue we were concerned about. We set out some ten points, which are. Uh, uh, basically, we can set up as criteria for success um, in relation to um, to the strategy, and we also pointed to existing evidence. So, just to remind you or to tell you, this was pro quite broadly supported, um, not just within the environmental sector, but obviously, but also within um, the uh, with by Commonweal, Craig's here from Commonweal, by the Poverty Alliance, the Scottish Women's Budget Group. Uh, and uh, the International Scotland, Scotland's International Development Alliance. So this is what we said. Um, start with um, as we. This is basically reiterating what Kate has said. The core goal of an economic strategy has to be to uh, achieve well-being for all while living within environment, environmental limits. And by asserting that, we are very clearly asserting that it should not be. Uh, the rate of GDP increase. So what, when we talk about this, and we drive down a bit, it does re refer to fairness and equality, it's to dignity and participation and, and regenerating nature, the economy being a means to these ends. Um, and it's the growth, we, we're not against growth, but it's growth of these indicators that we're seeking. Now, I, it is easy to say this, but I think we shouldn't underestimate how large a challenge this is to uh, the economics and the economic systems we have at the moment. It's basically saying that the externalities which uh, the economy creates, the, the damage it does to the environment, for exa example, or the inequalities it takes, have to be taken into account in the way the economy is run. What does that mean? It, it, you know, is that going to be done through the price mechanism? Is it going to be done through different uh, metrics? It's not just about what happens in the public sector, though that's important. It's about how do the, the private companies, how do enterprises make their decisions, their investment decisions and what they do. So that, that's the challenge we're, we're facing up to. We're going to um, go through some of the more detail. The next point we made is um, to drive down from that to some rather specific objectives. Uh, and it's important to be clear what your objectives are. So if we say we are meeting climate change targets, that's pretty clear. That means you're going to stop your emissions by a certain point in time. And that should focus the mind pretty, pretty clearly, I think. Um, speaking specifically about that, um, this is what you might call an absolute imperative. We are saying that by 2045, uh, I think the Scottish government says it will have ceased its contribution to climate change. It will have stopped uh, its own greenhouse gases and, by implication, those which are due to our consumption uh, throughout the world. It's not let's try and make the economy slightly greener or let's do something to make the economy more equal. It is let's stop these emissions. Uh, and it's that, to, to me, is the focusing of the mind on how you get the economy to do something which it hasn't done before, which is how do you focus on the external issue of stopping emissions, which, which we have to think through. And that's why we said, as Catherine's already mentioned, this has to uh, feature all of the fiscal and other le levers available uh, to government. Um, it's no longer the, 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 it's no longer possible to say that green issues or, or climate change are the responsibility of, say, the environmental department. No, they've got to be the responsibility of the transport department. They've got to be particularly the responsibility of econ economy, economy and finance departments. They've got to be the responsibility of all parts of government. Um, and there's a part of the recommendation of the Just Transition Commission which I think hasn't really been picked up and we should think about quite clearly. They say that a just transition to a, a zero carbon economy should be a national mission. Uh, and that is worth remembering and worth when the Scottish government says that it accepts the recommendations of the, um, of the commission, taking that into this uh, strategy for economic transformation, trans transformation. Because if it's a national mission, Sure, it has to be led by government, but it means it's the mission for a lot of other people as well, and that we embrace the um, 
the, the participation and the enthusiasm, as Stephen says, of trade unions and the workers they represent, of communities and, <clears throat> and of business uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 the whole of Scotland, really. So just going through this stuff about what, el what else this means. Um, yeah, we think we have to be realistic. Um, and we're saying, have I, got, have I gone to the wrong column? Oh yeah, sorry, this is the, the second point on this slide. Um, there's this idea of a theory of change, and I want to introduce that because you're going to come. We've we've offered the opportunity to talk about a theory of change in the in the breakouts. So the point we're making here is that the strategy has to show how those specific objectives will be achieved. That's not like we've got some programs who do some good stuff here. You know, we will do, we will support some green enterprise here, or we will reduce some emissions here. No, it's how do you, will this strategy, I think as Lorna actually said, show the steps by which, for in, in the case of climate change, emissions will be stopped. Uh, and it's, the theory of change is very helpful. It says, you know, set up your goal and work out the steps, which you know, basically A to Z or whatever stages it is, uh, to, to get there and check whether you've done that. And so it's clearly got to cover, as I said, not just green sectors, but the whole of economy. And it's got to look at the investment and the timescales within each of those sectors. This is where these ideas of just transition plans come in. Um, and in that sense, health and care will be just as important as manufacturing and, um, and uh, the renewable energy. So then we say, we well, let's get our feet on the ground in terms of realism. And I think Stephen was bringing some of that is, we have to combat, we have to recognize that it has to be a strategy which combats those forces which take the economy in the wrong direction. It's, it's not, you know, we, we can't just um, do good ourselves. We've got to work out what's obstructing this, this process because the climate crisis, environmental and bio, biodiversity breakdown and increasing inequalities are driven by the existing dynamics of the existing, existing economy. And behind those, let's accept there are vested interests who will, uh, at the best, in a sense, obstruct our, our desires, and the worst um, actually take us in the other direction. So that's where we bring in uh, points already made around patterns of ownership, how much of the economy is actually owned in Scotland and by whom, what business models we promote, uh, and, and so on. And, uh, and who are we empowering to make these changes here as well? Uh, who, who can, if there are vested interests to take on, how do we build a movement or uh, um, the strength to identify them and um, uh, perhaps work uh, around them or uh, persuade people of other ways or necessarily uh, actually uh, take them on. So that is moving on to, sorry, where are we? Yeah, let me get, sorry, this slideshow is not so automated. Um, so we want a different relationship, um, we think. We need a different relationship between the public and the private realms. Um, because this is going from that, I, that, that sort of understanding that we have to make the economy do something which it isn't you know, of its own accord or naturally going to do. The government does have to plan and, and, and it does have to direct the investment needed to make those changes happen. Uh, so it obviously needs to be decisive in setting the direction of the development for the economy and how enterprises should see that, that uh, should, should contribute to that because that's not going to come from the markets, whether or not they have a role in delivering it. They are go not going to ensure free and universal access to foundational services <clears throat> as much as they're not going to um, ensure that we keep within planetary limits unless we or the state requires it. Um, so Stephen's already mentioned the issue about public ownership. I think we're just framing it around the state has to uh, have a decisive role in the outcomes from our economy. And that means that every investment and every spending program has to be assessed against some clear tests. Um, what this this is both in the in the uh, the public sector. You, for example, we have an infrastructure investment program. Um, 
every piece of investment, every road building um, proposal or whatsoever has to be assessed against the test of, uh, of impact on a well-being economy. But also we need to work this through in the private sector and we need to know what we expect companies to do. And we need to talk to the finance sector, which can be both a friend and a foe in this. Its own methods and practices support all the investment decisions which are both uh, doing damage to our climate and our well-being, but also those ones which are taking us in the right direction. It has the power to be to change, and parts of it know how to do that. There's a big ethical investment sector. The problem is it's a small part of the finance sector. So we need to look at uh, how we work on finance issues, which is one of the issues which Kate has presented to us. So this might be a bit technical, a bit sort of dry, but it does mean we need to have metrics and data uh, which tell us uh, you know, what are the outcomes of these investment decisions um, and that they need to take precedence in policy decision making. Um, and I think that the next session will look a bit about that uh, and I won't um, try and step in where Christine and, um, and Doogie are going to step. Um, but clearly again, um, using these indicators um, f uh, in place of, um, of uh, the, the crude GDP metric. Uh, Getting close to that, this is my ninth point. Um, the this has to align with this is not this strategy needs not just to um, set out an economic path. It has to actively align with the work and strategies of other social partners. Uh, sometimes these are other government departments. Sometimes they're government um, government agencies, um, but they are also. Um, uh, in, in fields like housing, like um, community building, and so on. Uh, going back to that question, um, it has to be a national mission uh, which would embrace everybody from local government to the private sector, uh, and everybody needs to be engaged. And then we're just going to end up on a crucial point, um, which is about being inclusive. And um, Unless a strategy draws on uh, participation, say, from the workers affected, the communities affected, it's unlikely to be transformational. Uh, and it needs to hear from those people who ha both have the experience of uh, the problems which we are trying to address and some of the knowledge about how it works on the ground. <clears throat> we want to um, ensure that this strategy, when it comes out, is open for comment and consultation. Uh, so far, we we did draw attention to the rather short timeline on the consultation ending at the end of August, and we are specifically asking the Scottish Government, don't just give us your document, can you give us a, a, a draft which we can go away, talk about, input into and add to? Uh, so that we can all feel that we have owned this new strategy for national um, for economic tra transformation. So these are the points which we came up in our proposals, and we know that they're full of gaps. We know that there's lots more to be um, worked out in that. But um, in a sense, um, we do hope that it's a start in um, filling out some of the questions which Kate posed at the start, and also. Um, giving some ideas to Lorna um, about the content of her of the new strategy. So thank you very much. That's me from the Transform Our Economy Alliance uh, grouping. Matthew, thank you so much. That was fantastic as well. Speaking about the limitations of GDP, the 10 points from the previous meeting. Um, using all the fiscal levers we've got to hand, reinforcing what Catherine said at the beginning. Um, combating those vested interests and existing forces. Um, there was so much in there. And we, a side point, we at We All Scotland have been asked to be the Secretariat for a cross party group in a wellbeing economy and better metrics and data from what we called People First. So, a national mission that engages everyone from communities to the private sector are the two priority areas that we'll focus on to start with. So, it's really um, mutually reinforcing to hear again that this was coming up from this group before that as well. Um, okay, so we still have, we've got about 20 minutes and this is a point where we do have time for questions. So I wonder if 
Now, again, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and we can try to come to those as well, but it might be best our three speakers we've just heard from if you use the hand up function. So if you, um, I believe, click on reactions, you should be able to put your hand up. And we can go, whoever comes first can ask a question. Don't be shy. Ryan, I wonder if it's best if we spotlight our three other speakers as well. Just so uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Cheers. Any questions? Don't be shy. I know you've got questions or reflections or just anything you want to share. Phoebe does. Phoebe's waving. Hi, Phoebe. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. I can't find the hand up function on my screen. Um, so I'm Phoebe Cochran. I work for Scottish Environment Link. Um, my question is for Kate. Kate, I just wondered at what levels have you used the tools you were talking about? So what geographical levels have they been used at so far? Great question. Um, we are currently working with cities. So we began with cities because they were the ones who came to us first. We, we, we work with whoever who comes to us. So uh, we began with Amsterdam, currently working with the city of Toronto, exploring could this be a useful frame for them. But there are people in other places who have taken it, um, the island of Curaçao, the island of Barbados, they're exploring it actually as a, as a national scale. So I believe they can actually be applied at multiple levels. I showed an example from Birmingham. They're using it in Ladywood just at the neighborhood scale. And then we've seen nations like Barbados saying we're taking this as a framework. So because the concepts there are very scalable, what does it mean governance here very locally or nationally? We think it can be a useful tool, but of course we, we are trialing these tools they themselves on an experiment are they useful? And so we're really open to learning back from people and places of, of how to make them more useful. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Phoebe. Next question from Richard, who's got his hand up. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, I just wonder if any of the speakers have experience. I love the idea of a national mission, um, which Michael put on his slides. Um, so that we're all behind this and participation is one of the things I think everyone's mentioned as crucial. Um, my experience on the ground is that nobody wants to talk about this for whatever reason they have. Um, you know, it might be overwhelming or whatever. Um, and indeed, we've just watched a, an amazing play last night on television, which was called Why Is No One Talking About It? Uh, and so I wondered if any of the speakers had any insights into how some of the examples that Kate had on her slides from around the world, you know, how, how was enthusiasm generated to do those wonderful things? And how can we adopt that in our, in Scotland? Because as I say, on the ground, when we talk to people, it, it's, it's always a very, very short and quiet conversation. can jump in quickly and just speak to a couple of the places I know. So in Amsterdam, they, they, they've they really, the, the nation of the Netherlands have committed to creating a circular economy. So they've got the national level uh, saying we're going to be 100% circular by 2050, 50% circular by 2030. And I think there's uh, that that sense of we can, we can lead on this, we can be proud of this and moving from resenting something, avoiding something, finding it a burden and to, to there's, there is that amazing psychological, how do we get over that and say, actually, it's very exciting to be committed to this. It, it's unleashing so much national energy. When we give ourselves those really clear boundaries, people know the space ahead. And I'm seeing in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, a, a generation of young people coming out of university knowing that they're in a city that's going to create a circular economy, that just creates so many new opportunities to invent things and reinvent things. So I think these boundaries of clarity of what we are going to stop doing and what we're going to start doing really unleash that possibility. And then I'll just say in Melbourne, there was a, around 40 organisations and 600 people were involved in a conversation around what does it mean for Melbourne to thrive? And so they were coming up with a purpose and a vision statement for themselves of regenerative Melbourne. And I think, again, that's been done in a way that 
brings a lot of people across a lot of different civic networks and the local government into that conversation so you feel it's very alive. Amazing, Kate. Stephen, Matthew, anything to add? I'd just say, um, I wasn't quite sure, Richard, what you people are not interested in talking about, um, but um, I, I both wanted to say that, that um, yeah, there is a barrier that many people feel to talking about economics, and we have to overcome that barrier because um, unless we have an informed a sort of populace who can um, articulate their needs in ways which um, work economically, then we won't get to the place we need to be um but really there's always many you know aspects of uh these issues and the economy uh in general which everybody has a real passion for whether it's about housing whether it's about the environment whether it's about um you know their wages and income um i i think there's there's like there's no end of hooks through which we can engage people uh, i do think we do need to make a a you know, a step to, towards uh, having more people uh, able to take on the arguments around how we manage the economy. So we have some kind of economic democracy, uh, and that will be necessary. The more that we say, well, the state or the local state or, the, or, or social enterprises need to move into this territory, the more we as people have to be able to help guide them and, and critique them and, and, uh, and be enthusiastic with them. Thank you, Matthew. Um, the next two hands up, Peter and Philip. I wonder if we take two questions in a row, uh, just in the interest of time, and then we'll come to Rowan Aitchison's question, which was in the chat. Um, so Philip first, um, please. Oh, sorry, Peter first, Peter first. I was actually just gonna suggest taking a woman before me, because uh, we've had a rubber man. No, I think you were the next hand oh, up. Okay. Um, I, I just, I, th I think there's, uh, partly what I wanted to say is I think it's uh, really interesting that we're beginning to have these conversations about the economy and I think a way we probably didn't uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and I think part of what um, we really need to get the change that we want is to create a social movement around the economy. And I always think about the beverage report in the 1940s where people um, got so engaged and so excited by a set of proposals that they threw their whole weight behind it. That you know, you see a series of by-elections to, to the UK Parliament where beverage report candidates win against against sitting party candidates. And I mean, I suppose I'm, I'm really pleased that we're here discussing these things at this level in a way that we probably weren't before. But I just wanted to try and pick up on some of the ways that I. That the the speakers think we can try to build that sort of movement that can really make the impact at a, at a political level and articulate those demands in a way that that is transformational. Because I think uh, that's that's the way in which we're going to make the change that we need. Thank. Thank you, Peter. Philip, do you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask any of the speakers really about what what are the key changes needed at different levels in order to root remove growth dependence from our current economy because my limited understanding is that we depend on growth for the stability of the system at the moment so what are the key changes that need to be put in place i'll, I'll jump in and say i think this is a really big and critical question um, many of the institutions within our economies have been designed in the 20th century where growth was just coming uh, you could hope and expect for 3.5% a year, thank you very much. And so institutions got designed with the presumption of that and a lock into that. So it's a really important action to identify which institutions have come to assume that growth will always be coming, whether it's from the way pensions get designed and funded, um, or indeed how unemployment is handled. Do we just try to create more jobs or actually share some jobs? How do we see the future of um, the, the, the national output and what that has to be in terms of monetized return. So I'm just going to say that I think it's a really important question that's almost never addressed um, and has to be start being addressed. Stephen, you want to come in? Just to take that second question there. Um, 
at, at the risk of seeming obvious, uh, we need a massive expansion of public services and publicly delivered. We need things delivered. We need the things people need and the things people have to have should be delivered as a service rather than as a source of dividends. And the more that happens, the less the economy becomes based on growth. I mean, to take the, the obvious example this week, the energy system. Now, Unison is actually the biggest union in energy. Now, that's not because we have members offshore. We don't. We have members because the energy companies were initially municipal. They were built up as a network of municipal, town and city gas and electricity uh, companies that eventually were agglomerated and became national systems. And, they're not, and they belong to us now, they belong to somebody else. So they're required to run at a profit. If, they were required, if, if their primary requirement was making sure everybody had a warm home and, and could cook their dinner, then we would see a far, far different take on, uh, what's, on what happens. And we wouldn't have the ludicrous situation of so much time, effort, and energy being wasted on price comparison websites. Except that's a, the price comparison websites is a fairly small social gain. But overall, you know, these, these things were built up by us, for us, and now they're for somebody else, and that needs to change. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Catherine, you've kindly offered to come in on the, oh no, you said enough hands up. You won't come in on the growth question, that's fine. We've had a question in the chat that was next in the order. And I'll just copy and paste that to the bottom. So it's keen. This was from Rowan Aitchison. Um, how can we communicate these ideas through mainstream media to fully engage citizens? Sorry, I'm on a train at the moment, so can't ask in person. I'm glad you managed to ask a question, Rowan. Thank you. Um, what are people's thoughts on that on the panel? And then we'll come to the final four hands up and that'll take us to lunch. I'll just quickly say on that, and also Peter's uh, point, which didn't, which uh, hasn't been attended to yet. Um, I think we should I'll just sort of jump to the opportunity we might have with this idea of a um, a strategy for economic transformation and um, you know, the idea of a, a national mission around just transition um, to to try that out, to try out uh, as. Peter says, a social movement around the economy to use um, both the crises, the crises of which we are facing and the opportunities uh, to get that, that kind of discussion going. And as uh, the question points out, to use, make sure we don't just do it amongst ourselves, but in the mainstream media. I'll very quickly just say the, you know, one thing which makes me um, reasonably, uh, not confident, but, but um, optimistic is that the way in which the environmental movement has um, started to engage with economic issues because essentially without going on any longer um, we've realized that we cannot achieve our environmental objectives without tackling or addressing uh, economic uh, solutions to it so I, i'll stop there and let the other questions come in thank you matthew Stephen, you're on unmuted you want to come in I um, You're on mute now, Stephen. <laughs> um, that was probably best I was on mute just now. Um, in terms of communicating things, it's not about, we need to, whilst, and, and Peter is right, it is good that these things are now part of an economic debate, but in making these things relevant to people, it's not talking about the economy. It's talking about your house, your job, your bus, you know, your bills. And I'm always taking it back to people's direct relevant experience. And just on that, um, at the risk of, of uh, waving a blade at a sacred cow, the, the term just transition, that really doesn't say much to an awful lot of people. Most specifically, um, it doesn't say much to people who actually are the people we need to get on board. 
Um, there was a, a report last year, early this year, um, called Offshore, and it spoke to offshore workers who showed zero loyalty to the firms they worked for and not much enthusiasm for the, for the concept of working offshore and working in fossil fuels. They were overwhelmingly more than happy to go and do something else if they could pay their bills. So that's all really good. The term just transition did not, they, they, nobody knew what it meant. So I'm not saying we abandon the concept, but we really need to think about how we talk about it. Spot on, Stephen, spot on, thank you. Um, so we'll take Martin and Richard's questions next. And I would really like us to come on to Kate and Isabel because we've not had enough questions, I think, from women today. So let's try and do that before 12.30. Martin and Richard, next. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's really a question to Stephen. Um, I agree pretty much with everything he said about what Scottish government should be doing, expansion of public services and so on. I'm just wondering what the trade union movement can do now, as opposed to demanding things of other people, what it can do itself to help uh, speed up this transition. And specifically, I'm thinking what Peter said around, you know, creating a social movement and so on. It seems to me trade unions could be the core of that. And I'm also just wondering what trade unions are doing in terms of the new the economic changes, such as the gig economy uh, involving mostly young people, how they can organize uh, people, uh, those people who are really suffering at the sharp end of austerity. Uh, and I'm seeing new unions that I've never heard of coming in to kind of like organize uh, workers in Uber and Deliveroo and so on. So I'm just wondering how the trade union movement is, is shaping up to that challenge. Can we take Richard's question as well? Thank you. Fine, thank you. Um, Globalised business dominates governments. We can lobby as much as we like, but we're never really going to get fundamental change by that. Uh, we, we need to work from below. And I want to highlight something Matthew mentioned, that the the technique called theory of change is, is a very good way of um, working out how change can come about. Um, <clears throat> it, of course, it will be different in different locations. I, I've tried this out for the uh, Scottish borders rural economy and found um, some interesting things. What, what, you, what it reveals is what are the, um, what are the, um, what's the room for maneuver that people have in different locations? And in that particular case, it came out as being um, renewable energy, because that's something government hasn't pri privatized yet and, and is not dominated uh, by the commercial sector, generated and used locally. Massive financial advantages to this, and therefore it could, in fact, work. Now, having identified that, the problem then, and this is the question really, is how can such initiatives then be supported? They've been derived logically. They, they, have, they make sense. People want them. Where does the support come from? There's too much support, I think, going to the top. That's the too, too much uh, lobbying, you know, rather than support for the bottom. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to make the decision to bring in Kate and Isabel just now, leaving the panel with a hard task of remembering all the questions. Um, so good luck with answering those. Kate, can we hear from you next, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for the great presentation so far. My question is very specifically about younger people. So I work uh, with under 35 year olds um, in a youth climate charity. And basically what frustrates me is seeing these solutions, how exciting they are. But the people that I work with have the least agency to kind of influence their workplaces. So I just wondered if the panel has any um, sort of practical tips that maybe not just younger people but maybe people who don't have a lot of agency within the workplace or maybe like more junior how do we get these conversations happening if our senior management aren't at that position to kind of allow us to be at the table um, and just thinking about strategies so many companies maybe have like a five-year strategy 
and it's very focused on like profit and growth of the company so how do we get into those spaces to even have a conversation about it at the moment fantastic question kate thank you and at last but not least isabel hi yeah yeah thanks um so i i have quite a specific question as well um so i guess it's about this issue that a few people have touched on that the the process that the scottish government's currently going through to develop this new strategy isn't inclusive enough and um, so i just wanted to hear a bit from the speakers about what tactics they think we can collectively use to smash through some of these barriers and to make sure that the um that we can actually get genu genuine kind of inclusive engagement with this process thanks super thank you so much isabel so i suggest we have maybe two minutes from each speaker before we finish up that will take us over time but that way we've heard from all of the people and are responding so who would like to go first I'm happy to jump in. I'll just respond to Kate's question about young people in workplaces. It's, it's a fascinating one. Very briefly, I would say, first of all, to those young people, never underestimate your power. You may be uh, a junior position in the company or a new graduate employee, but you are the future of the company. And if they can't attract and retain you, they know that they're on a downward curve. And I've, I've met CEOs actually who've put in place a sustainability strategy after being embarrassed when a young graduate raised their hand at the back of the room and said, and what are we doing on sustainability? And the CEO realized they didn't have an answer. And if I can't answer this next generation, whatever position they hold today, they their ability to track them is key to the company. I also think there's really interesting companies doing things like Good Energy has uh, created a youth board. So they've got a, a board now of the company of young people advising that company really interesting innovations that even when companies seem very very focused on profit i think there's they also know that there's change coming and we have to have the courage to raise hands to stand up and ask that question even if it feels awkward in the meeting to ask the question you can bet that the manager is going away feeling more awkward that their answer no longer works so that's one thing i would say thank you kate fantastic I was delighted to hear that under 35 is still considered young. So thank you <laughs> to the other case. Um, Matthew, you've unmuted. Do you want to come in? Oh, yeah. Um, th th there are lots of really, I'll try and be very quick on some of these. I thought Kate's question was very pertinent. Um, and it's not much of an answer directly to say that, you know, we, we are advocating in relation to just transition that, that and um, the government is sort of moving in this direction that there ought to be just transition plans for each sector and um, there might be just transition plans for um, big companies and I do hope Stephen will comment on this that the trade unions will start to put just transition onto their ne negotiating agendas but um, as you say Kate they know that you're, the people you're talking to may not be members of trade unions and there may not be those processes available yet i.e I, hopefully there will be things happening which they can respond to um, but I, I do think that the more fuss we make and the more the extinction rebellion and the climate strikes happen the the, the easier it is for people whether at whatever age you know or however um, central or, or marginal they might be to start a conversation with their managers about well what are we doing about that so I mean I obviously wish you wish you luck and, I, and it's actually a, a really important part of the movement which we have have to build um I I will let St Stephen reply to Martin's question um very quickly to Richard um the I think it's a really important point which you're asking, I believe you're asking, is how, how do we make sure that a local renewable energy initiative uh, will get the support it needs and how can that be generalised across the country? And we do have to talk about this within this strategy. For example, I think Stephen's already mentioned the Scottish National Investment Bank, which we've had some part in, in, in proposing and, and, and we're glad to see it set up because it's pointed in the right direction, but it's not... It hasn't got the scale to do what Stephen said, transform the Scottish economy. It needs scale. So when we think about scale, you've got to learn from how well and what, you know, what job they're doing and how they are doing those jobs. But we've got to think about how our pension funds, local government pension funds and other funds, are investing in uh, the, the, the kind of initiatives which will help transform the economy. Um, but we do also have to put to the Scottish government how in this strategy, it will actively enable and support people in their communities or in, in one company or another to create new, new, new models of, of enterprise, which can put social objectives higher up there, the hierarchy rather than profit, and which can anchor 
that enterprise within the local community. And lastly, I have to move very quickly to, to Isabel. Yeah, just in terms of what happens after this, if we if the Scottish government produces a draft and says, what do you think? Let's have a national debate. Then the answer to your question is, yeah, we get stuck in. That's great. And we work alongside them. If they produce a document which says, here's our policy, get, you know, take it or leave it, then we, if we can identify elements of it which are predict, you know, which, which need challenge or need serious development, then we can use that, um, whether or not they've said, you know, this is it, uh, because that's a, a sort of topic which we can then take and, and try and use. I hope those are half useful responses to some of that. Stephen. Um, uh, briefly, Martin asked about the gig economy. That's really for another time. But the short version of that is unions have got a choice. You either attempt to organise in it and improve it, or you try to operate at a strategic level and get rid of it. And frankly, both things are being tried just now. Um, what are unions doing currently? Well, uh, I Unison have a network of green reps uh, that we are, and we're trying to get them formal recognition from employers uh, in order to push uh, sustainability and so on and, and, and different employers. Um, and unions as a whole, I mean, have very much pushed just transition uh, to government and, um, and in environmental campaigns, not that, because frankly, Sometimes the unions have to be pragmatic and the, the members don't expect them to campaign them out of a job. But so we've been across the movement working in environmental campaigns for a very pragmatic reason that unless you can provide other employment, people will not support mechanisms to decarbonize the economy and you just won't get the popular support for it. So uh, unions have been doing that um, as well as uh, what Matthew has suggested. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying it's been a huge aspect of what people have done, but there have been a number of uh, internal union going to companies and saying, you could change, you could do this, we could do other and better things with our skills. You know, I mean, there's not been nearly as much of it as there needs to be, but it, but it has happened. And I think hopefully we'll see it growing. Um, in Unison's case, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm meant to tell you, but during COP, we will be launching a significant piece of research about greening public services, which are obviously a big part of the economy, a big part of... Uh, carbon usage, you know, so we, we're, we're going to be pushing stuff out about that. Um, and uh, young people, uh, if young people are lacking an agency, they should join a union. That is the easiest way to get agency in a workplace. Um, individuals are always vulnerable. Um, uh, collective action that will make the difference. Okay, let's wrap this up, guys. Fantastic questions. Fantastic reflections, Matthew, Stephen, Kate, thank you so much for your presentations and for taking those questions.